Good morning. This is your Stats Sensei, Mr. Spensei, and we're going to work problems 11 through 21 for exam A extra credit. This will be 11 through 21. The following two-way table resulted from classifying each individual in a random sample um, of residents of a small city according to level of education with categories earned at least a high school diploma and did not earn a high school diploma and employment status with categories employed full-time and not employed full-time. If the null hypothesis of no association, and this is something under chi-squared, between level of education and employment status is true, which of the following expressions gives the expected number? Well, the expected number is something we learned how to do in the first semester who earn at least a high school diploma and who are employed full-time. So who earned at least a high school diploma, so that's this, and who are employed full-time, which is this. All right, and so they're saying no association. When they say that, they're looking for independent. Now, they said if which means let's pretend that they're independent. Well, if we're pretending they're independent, it's basically 82 times 92 divided by the total. So in that case, it's B, all right? So number 11 should be B, but the other way to think about it is we know that the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. Well, that's true if they're independent, in which case we would have gone 82 times 157 times 92 over 157. And that would have given us our probability, because, but we want the expected value. Well, the expected value, remember expected value is essentially n times p, or the sample size times the probability. Well, there's our probability, so I need to come back and multiply by the sample size of 157. And those cross out, and once again, 82 times 92 divided by 157. And regardless which way you approach it, you get b. Number 12. The manager of a factory wants to compare the mean number of units assembled per employee in a week for uh, two newly assembly techniques. 200 employees from the factory are randomly selected, and each is randomly assigned to one of the two techniques. After teaching 100 employees one technique and 100 employees the other technique. So basically, we have two groups. We have one group with 100 and one group with another 100. And we're going to call it technique one. One group is technique one, and one group gets technique two. Which of the following would be the most appropriate inferential statistics in this situation? Well, we have two different groups. So that gets rid of one sample paired. It's not a chi-squared test. It's also not a one sample. The only thing it could be would be a two-sample t-test. And because we didn't know the mean and standard, we did not know the standard deviation of the two groups prior, it couldn't have been a two sample Z, which wasn't even asked, but it could only be a two sample T test because we have two separate groups. A random sample has been taken from a population. A statistician using the sample needs to decide whether to construct a 90% confidence interval for the population mean or a 95% confidence interval for the uh, population mean. How will these intervals differ? Well, let's talk about that. As the confidence level goes up, the width goes up. As standard deviation goes up, the width goes up. As the sample size goes up, the width goes down. So 90% versus a 95, and that's all we know. Well, the 90% the 90 will not be as wide as the 95. So the percent of confidence interval will not be as wide as the 95, and that is A. So 13 is A. 14. The box box above summarize two data sets, one and two. All right. Based on the box pots, which of the following statements about the two data sets cannot be justified? 
the range of data set one is equal to the range of data set two. Well, both start at 20 and end at six, uh, 60. So this is a true statement and we're looking for cannot be justified, all right? The interquartile range of data set one is equal to the interquartile range of set two. Well, the IQR 50 minus 35 is 15. So this one has an IQR 15. And this is 45 minus 30. So it has an IQR 15. So this is a true statement and we're looking for false. The median of data set one is less than the median of data set two. Looks like 35 versus 45, so that's true. Data set one and data set two have the same number of data points. I really don't know. This could be a thousand data points and this could be a million or this could be a hundred. So I'm not sure. This one looks possible. So that could be my answer. About 75% of the values in data set two are greater than or equal to about 50% in data one. Well, remember, each section represents 25%. So there's 50% right here, the median. And here I have, there's 25, here's another 25, and here's another 25. So that's 75%. Looks like about 75% is greater than 50%. So this looks true. So our answer to number 14 is D. A high school statistics class wants to conduct a survey to determine what percentage of students in the school will be willing to pay a fee for participating in after-school activities. 20 students are randomly selected from each of the freshman class. So we have freshmen with 20, sophomores with 20, juniors with 20, and seniors with 20. Um, 20 students are randomly selected from each of the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes to complete the survey. The plan is an example of what type of sample. Well, anytime I break it into groups, it's either going to be stratified or it's going to be clustered. So we can get rid of B, C, and E. So it's either going to be clustered or stratified. But since we are taking uh, 20 from one group and 20 from another group and 20 from another group and 20 from another group, this will be a situation of stratified. With a cluster, we randomly select a group and survey all. So cluster, randomly select a group and survey all. Here we broke them into groups and then randomly selected from each group. So this is not a cluster, this is a stratified because once again, we broke them into groups and randomly selected from each group, all right? So 16, Jason wants to determine how age and gender are related to political party affiliation in his town. Voter registration lists are stratified by gender and age group. Jason selects a simple random sample of 50 men from the age 20 to 29 group and records their age, gender, and party registration. So he's okay from the age 20, he's recording that. Uh, he also selects an independent sample of 60 women from the 40 to 49 age group and does the same thing. Of the following, what is the most important observation about uh, Jason's plan? Well, what I notice is Jason doesn't represent all men age groups, nor does he represent all women age groups. So it looks like age is going to be a confounding variable. All right, so um, the plan is well conceived. Does I don't think so, because he's trying to determine how age and gender are related. And it's like, nope, we don't have enough age. We don't have both types of ages with women. We don't have both types of ages with men. The samples are too small. And the answer is no, not really. You should have used equal sample sizes, certainly not necessary. You should have randomly selected the two age groups instead of choosing them non-randomly. Maybe, but I don't really like that. He will be unable to tell whether a difference in party affiliation is less related to differences in age or gender. And that's because age and gender are confounded because he only selected women of one age and men of one age. So E is my correct response. You should have chosen some men from the 20 to 29 age group and some men in the 
um, 40 to 49 age group, and he should have selected some women in the uh, 20 to 29 and some um, um, women in the um, 40 to 49, and he did not do that. He confounded them. All right. At least, at least squares regression line, and this is something you're going to warn about in regression, was fitted to the weights in pounds versus age and months of a group of many children. The equation of line is this. Well, remember, y hat is our predicted. So this is going to be our predicted value here, where y hat is a predicted weight and t is the age of the child. A 20-month-old child in this group has an actual weight of 25 pounds, which of the following is the residual weight. Well, residual equals the observed minus the expected, or actual minus the predicted, however you want to look at that. So in this case, we, we need to figure out a residual, but we know our actual, our actual, the child actually weighed 25 pounds, so we know that, that's what we observe, but we don't know the expected, so we're going to calculate that. So we'll have y hat equals 16.6 .6 plus 0.65 times the number of months, 20. And when I do that, I run that through my calculator, and I ended up getting 16.6 .6 plus 0.65 times 20. I end up getting 29.6. So y hat equals 29.6. So 25 minus 29.6. So basically, we have a negative residual of negative 4.6. This child is weighing 4.6 pounds less than was expected. All right? If it was the residual had been zero, they weighed what's expected. If it's positive, the child weighs more than expected. But in this case, we weigh um, 4.6 pounds less than expected. Which of the following statements are true about the T distribution with K degrees of freedom? They talk like this to confuse you, but we're going to try to work through it. The T distribution is symmetric. Yes, the T distribution is symmetric in mound shape and centered at zero. So this is a true statement. The T distribution with K degrees of freedom has a smaller variance than a T distribution with K plus one. This is what I mean by they're trying to confuse you. So I'm just going to randomly select a number, and I'm going to say, okay, let's pretend like K equals 30. All right? So 30 degrees of freedom versus 31. Oh, that means this one has a larger sample size. A larger sample size has less variation. So the more degrees of freedom, the less variation, the less area in the tails. This is false. All right. Now, the T distribution has a larger variance than the standard normal. This is true. As we increase the sample size for the T distribution, it approximates the normal, but it never gets to it. There's more area in the tails for the T distribution. So it turns out one and three are true. So my answer choice is E. All right. The next problem is the chi-squared distribution. And it's also going to be a goodness of fit. And I don't think you've learned how to do this just yet. So geneticists hypothesize that if half of a population will have brown eyes, so that means 50%, um, and the other half will be, a, a select, will be evenly split between blue and green eyes. So in other words, if this is 50%, then I have 50% to split. That means this is going to be 25% or 0.25. So 25% split here. All right. In a random sample of 60 people, 34 plus 15 plus 11, that equals uh, 60 people. Uh, from this population, the individuals are distributed as shown in the table above. What is the chi-squared test statistic? Well, I need to multiply what is my expected values. So I have to multiply all of these by 60 because n times p. And I end up getting, I expect this to be 30 because half of 60 is 30. This is a fourth of 60 is 15. And a fourth of 60 is 15. 
So with that information, I'm going to put these values into L1 and these values into L2. So I've already done that, 34, 15, and 11, 30, 15, and 15, stat, calc, test. And I'm going to run down. Now, this is a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And I know that because I'm trying to. So it's not a chi-squared test. It's chi-squared goodness of fit. I have that information, L1 and L2. And when I press, um, and the reason I know it's a goodness of fit is because I expect it to look like, I expect it to follow this distribution these percentages, so I expect it to follow this, but this is what I got, so I need to sit there and go, okay, does my expected distribution match my actual? Because this is my expected distribution, and this was my actual distribution, or observed minus expected. And when I press enter, I have L1, L2. It asks for my degrees of freedom. It's not has nothing to do with the sample size for the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are the number of categories, and we have one, two, three. We have three categorical groups. So degrees of freedom, n minus one, so three minus one. And I get 1.6, all right? So what is the value of the chi-squared statistic? Well, my chi-squared statistic is 1.6. So it's not less than one. It is at least one, but it's less than 10. All right, because it was 1.6, which is greater than one, and, and 1 1.6 is less than 10. Moving on to number 20. Again, this is something that's going to be more regression, so you probably don't know it yet. A small town employees 35 four salaried non-union employees each employee receives an annual salary increase of 500 to 2000 based on performance review by the mayor's staff some employees are members of the mayor's political party and the rest are not okay so we have people receiving uh, bonuses some are part of the party and some are not and the bonuses saw somewhere between 500 and 2000 Students at a local high school go hmm, uh, and form two lists, A and B. One for the raises granted to employees who are in the party and those who raises granted who are not. They want to display a graph or graphs of salary increases in the student newspaper that readers can use to judge whether the two groups of employees have been treated in a reasonably equitable manner. In other words, they want to know if the, the mayor is paying his friends who are in the same party. Which of the following displays is least likely to be useful to readers for this purpose. So we want least likely. Well, I could have a, 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 a STEM plot and a back-to-back -back parties. So I could sit there and go, yeah, party A, party B, that works. I'll come back to this one. So that works. Parallel box part plots would work. Party A versus party B, that would work. Histograms, well, that's basically a stem plot. Stem plot has more information, but that would also work. Dot plots, I could sit there and make a dot plot. I put how many with party A and how many with party B and get my shape, that would work. But a scatter plot does not work. A scatter plot is when you're measuring um, two different um, two different topics for a single point. So I can measure height and weight for a single per, uh, person. I can measure um, income and height for a single person, age versus um, health status for a single person. So every single point has two measurements. Here I don't have two measurements. I only have a single measurement. I have how much bonus you received, all right? So that one would not work. In a study of, and then this is 21, this is the last one, and this is re related to reg regression. So in a study of the performance of computer printer, the size and kilobytes and the printing time uh, for 22 small 
text files were recorded. So this is my sample size. That's pretty important. The regression line was a satisfactory description of the relationship between size and printing time. The results of the regression analysis are shown below. So here we have this regression analysis. And the part that we will care about for this class is that right here. All right. Um, which of the following should be used to uh, compare a 95% confidence interval for the slope of the regression line? Well, first off, all regressions are T. So we're going to have a T statistic. But we need our T statistic for regression will have degrees of freedom of N minus two, all right? N minus two, because we're uh, not only are, we're, are we estimating the slope, we're also estimating the standard deviation. So let's go ahead and calculate our T statistic. So second bar, our T star, second bars, inverse T, one minus 0.95 divided by two, and degrees of freedom is gonna be 22 minus two, and I end up getting 2.0859 or 2.086. Well, that gets rid of B. That also gets rid of C. And that also gets rid of E. Because there's my, because remember, we're going to end up with B plus or minus T star times S over B. Now, remember, that's standard error, because that's going to be tricky here. And this is B hat. So our slope will always be below the constant. So this is our X value. There's our slope. So 3.47812 plus or minus our T star value of 2.086 times the standard error. The nice thing is, they actually ca calculated the standard error for us. Now we're only looking at this slope line. That's the only thing we're looking for. There's my slope. And here's my standard error of the slope. So times 0 0.294. 3.4782 plus 2.086 times 0.294. This answer to this one is A. All right, I hope that helped. And we will see you on the next one.